Who's your team? Who's your favorite player? I can't tell you how many times I've started conversations with people I don't know or people I do know with that with those questions. And the irony about these questions is, for one, they don't really help me get to know this the person I'm trying to get to know. If you tell me that all of your life you've been ha you have been a Jacksonville Jaguars fan, this this may actually tell me a little bit about you, but it really doesn't let me know too much about you. And two, being a fan of a team or a player doesn't involve actually knowing any of the people on these teams or organizations on a personal level. It kind of just involves sitting on the sidelines like I am now, cheering them on from a distance. Hello, I'm Luke Jackson, and I'm one of the ministers at Albany Church of Christ. Uh, thank you for joining me for my fourth episode of the Building a Frame series. Uh, last week, we uh, discussed about the Holy Spirit and uh, the importance of his role in the Christian faith and even Jesus' uh, sta strong statement to his apostles as he was leaving, that it is to their advantage that he would leave so that the Spirit could come. Uh, this week, I'd like to discuss with you one of the subjects in the fourth book that the teens and I am here in Albany went through called Not a Fan by Kyle Eidelman. <clears throat> this book also tends to be quite well known, and Eidelman here in this book does a pretty good job at um, providing a challenging and biblical uh, book on uh, helping us decipher whether we are fans of Jesus or whether we're followers of Jesus. And he uses a bunch of different biblical stories and, and uh, subjects to talk about this. Now, I'm not gonna do a full book review by any means today about this, but uh, I'd, like you, I'd like to expand on one of the subjects that he talks about uh, in this book. What is it like to know Jesus? Uh, today, I'd like to discuss with you a common trap that many of us in the church fall into in regard to knowing Christ. And then I'll discuss what it actually looks like when we actually begin to know Jesus and to have intimacy with him on a personal level and what this can mean for us. So in my opening statements today, I referenced the questions, who is your team or, or who is your favorite player? Now, I don't want to badmouth sports. I'm certainly, uh, I, I love fantasy football. I enjoy playing sports and watching sports. And uh, I'm just kind of creating a frame similar to the book, Not a Fan, uh, by uh, utilizing the concept of being a fan of Jesus versus being a follower of Jesus and, and what that means. And personally, my favorite player has always been Steve Nash. Uh, he's a basketball player, and on the, he played for the Phoenix Suns for most of his career, and, and growing up, uh, my family would cheer on the Dallas Mavericks, uh, and the biggest games in my family in those times would be when the Dallas Mavericks played against the Phoenix Suns. And uh, part of me probably enjoyed just being the black sheep of the family and rooting for the opposite team, and, and, and yet I just loved how Steve Nash played. I loved uh, how he played, and, and I could walk you through some of the great stats he has and some of the great moments of his career. One of them that I, I ended up looking on YouTube because I was curious about it and watching it uh, was when uh, he the Suns, of course, were playing the San Antonio Spurs in the playoffs, as they always did, and they typically lost. Um, and Tim Duncan drives into the lane, and he uh, inadvertently elbows Nash above the eye, and this leads to the Suns winning. Uh, uh, Steve Nash actually, before they win the game, Steve Nash actually has to get six stitches above his eye. He's bleeding profusely, coming out of his eye. He goes and gets six stitches, and he actually comes back into the game plays the fourth quarter and he plays a great fourth quarter he gets 10 points and other awesome assists and just makes some big plays and he actually leads the Suns to win that game and, and when I talk about this I get pumped and I, I feel like I, I'm excited to talk with you about this and, and I can tell you some more things about Nash and I would regard myself as a pretty good expert in knowing things about him and yet I don't know him at all I don't know him I know things about him and I think this is uh, sort of the precise pit that many of us in the church fall into in knowing Jesus. I mean, think about it. Uh, many of our churches are set up to disperse knowledge about Christ into our minds. We have Sunday school where we attend Bible classes weekly and lectures where we absorb uh, material about Jesus. And Wednesday nights, we do the same thing. We have sermons and lectures every week during our church services. And, and many kids like myself even participate in things like Bible Bowl or other things like Vacation Bible School, uh, where we can memorize and gather and, and be invested in the Bible. Now, before I continue, none of these things are bad. Not all of these things are actually good. I'm not trying to say we should stop having classes or lectures or workshops or anything else uh, to learn about God. However, the questions we, we need to ask ourselves amidst all of this learning is, do we have a relationship with God beyond just knowing about him? Someone shared this metaphor with me once, and it helps me to begin thinking about this. Now, imagine yourself, you're at work, you're at school, wherever you normally are, someone comes to you and, and shares with you the news that your brother 
or your sister doesn't exist. I would imagine that many of us, including myself, uh, shout out to Brady, uh, would be quite confused, all right? I, I respond, I just talked with Brady yesterday. He's exists, what, what are you even saying? I would quickly remind myself and think through all the experiences that my brother and I have been through together. And, and I would think, how could someone deny these experiences? How could someone say that all this was a hoax? How can you say that he doesn't exist? This is a joke, you know, this, this is, I would sit there and just be dumbfounded. It wouldn't make sense. Now imagine a similar experience. You're at work or wherever you are and someone comes to you and shares with you that Jesus doesn't exist. Would your thoughts go to the same place that your thoughts went with your brother and sister not existing? If someone denies the existence of Jesus to us, to, to someone who is in Christ, not only are they making a statement about Jesus and his existence, they're actually also making a statement about you and your relationship with him. If we are in Christ, that means we have a relationship with Christ. That even though we can't see him with our eyes right now, we have been through so many things with him. We've been through so many experiences with him. Even though we can't hear him audibly, we know that he's present with us in the good times and the bad. However, if we only have knowledge about Jesus, as if we were a distant fan sitting on the bleachers looking out at him and cheering him on, even if we're in church and that's where we're cheering, uh, what do we lose if Jesus doesn't exist? What do we lose if someone denies our relationship with him and we don't have any intimacy with him? What do we lose? You know, it is one thing to teach material or concepts about Christ, but how do we teach someone, or even ourselves, to have a relationship with Jesus? And what does this actually look like? What does having a relationship actually look like to have it with Christ? Now, this question of, of, of all this it would take quite a while to talk about the, the nature of our Christian faith and the relationship that we can have with Christ, and I'm not going to even attempt to cover every facet of this. Um, that being said, I think a great scripture to begin with today is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So this passage reveals a lot to us about having a relationship with Jesus. First, notice that this, this metaphor being used by Peter here. Christians grow up in Jesus into salvation, just like newborn infants grow up and develop into mature adults. That's kind of what's going on here. Jesus is comparing Christians growing up into Jesus and little infants growing up uh, into adults and into older kids. And the neat thing about this metaphor is it points out that being a Christian and having a relationship with Christ is actually a gradual thing. Um, it's a process that it develops over time, just like any other relationship does. And if you think about it, it's actually okay if right now, I've, as I talk about this, you, you think about your relationship with Jesus and you're like, man, I, I don't feel very close to him. He just seems like a concept or he just seems like uh, I need to read about him. My parents forced me to go to church or my parents forced me to read this and it's just something I don't really experience. And that's okay right now. It, it takes time and it's a process. We're just thinking about these things. Or perhaps uh, in the season you're at right now, um, you have some growing to do. Perhaps that maybe God could be using this very time that you're in to help you develop your relationship with Jesus in a different way than you have before. Whatever it is, we, we can begin to understand that our relationship with Christ, uh, if we think about this metaphor that Peter brings up. Um, what this metaphor also shows us as far as our Christian relationship with Christ is um, the mechanism of growth. And I gotta tell you, as a dad with a seven month old kid at home, I certainly can see firsthand how someone as little and even as powerless as Avery can have a huge, huge craving for milk. When she is ready, she will do all she can to communicate with us about this. <laughs> she will cry, she will reach out, she will, she now even crawls. She craves milk. She craves this nurturing. And she has learned that this milk and nurturing can actually give, give her what she needs and, and, what, she, and what she feels. Now, bringing this back over to the Christian walk, Peter is urging these people to hear that if, if as they are learning what it is to be uh, in Christ, to have a relationship with him, that they should long and crave for spiritual milk. So, so what is this spiritual milk exactly? Uh, is it the communion cup? What, what is this? Well, if you read the, the previous verses right before this passage in 1 Peter 2, you'll see that it's talking all about the word of God. It's talking all about it, and, and Peter, um, so therefore, Peter is using this spiritual milk or, or God's word uh, to encourage us Christians to crave and long for God's word and God's truth. 
just as with with just as much intensity and dependence that infants crave milk. That's what he's getting at here. However, the key here is that Christians, unlike newborns, don't grow out of their dependence on God's word. Newborns uh, eventually will grow out of the need to just to crave and need milk, and they'll eat normal food and they'll continue to develop. But Christians, you know, one day we're not going to wake up and be like, oh, okay, I I have enough. I'm done. Uh, I'm full. Now, how does that make so? Why, how can we never get to that point? If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, Peter here is referring to. Uh, he's referencing Psalm 34, and saying that ta we should taste that the Lord is good. That we should experience that the Lord is good. So, how can we taste? How can we experience God and, and His goodness? What does that mean? And, and how does this have to do with our relationship with Christ? Well, if you think about it, think about how Jesus refers to himself and what Jesus talks about in the Gospels and, and the metaphors that he uses. Jesus, in the, with this huge crowd, right after he's fed them and, and, and did a great miracle in giving them bread and fish with plenty of leftovers, he goes into this, this lecture about how he is the bread of life that fulfills. And um, then he goes on and tells them even something even crazier. He, he tells them, if it, you never want to hunger again, you will eat of my flesh that um, if you would like to be completely fulfilled, then you should become cannibals. <laughs> that, that's, that's how the people received it. They were, they were a little confused, of course, by, by Jesus' statements here. And, and at this point, weird enough, as Jesus continued teaching and as his disciples began to, to catch on to how Jesus was speaking of himself, bread of life, living water, all these things uh, that someone takes in and experiences, um, we think of the Lord's Supper, something that a lot of us do weekly and, and sometimes even less frequently. Um, in the Lord's Supper, we are participating in a meal where we, in a way, eat or partake of Christ. That when we break the bread, we know that this represents Jesus' body that was broken for us. That when we drink the cup, we remember his blood and how it atones for us. So what is all, all this sensory language and metaphor getting at? Here it is. Our relationship with Christ was never meant to be an intellectual exercise. It was never meant to be a book that we read to know it better than other people or something that we can use to have our advantage over others just like the Pharisees did. No, our relationship with Jesus is a feast. Our relationship with Jesus is an experience. Our relationship with Jesus is something that fills us up. And as we read more and more about Christ and learn about him and, and our development, we don't just add to our stat sheets about him. We don't just add to our columns, okay, now I understand this about him and I have gained this knowledge and, and there it is, let's keep going. It's not just about the knowledge, it's about knowing him, that he is indeed alive, he is a person. So as we worship God with our voices and with our lives as living sacrifices, we do so in a manner that actually fills us up as we empty ourselves out. That our relationship with Christ was never meant to be this list of rules or a bunch of things we can't or can't do. Our relationship with Christ has such great potential because God knows us. Read Psalm 139, you'll see that over and over again, God knows us on a deep level. He, he formed us beautifully in our mother's wombs, and, and that God, the God of the universe who created all of this knows us better than ourselves. May we spend time becoming more intimate with Christ. May it not just be an intellectual exercise. May we not just be fans sitting on the sidelines cheering Jesus and those crazy Christians on. May we begin slowly to have a relationship with him. May we allow the Holy Spirit to pour his love into our hearts so that worshiping God and, and reading his word becomes more and more transformative as God fulfills us and, and changes us from the inside out. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, it's been good to be with you, and I hope that uh, you all stay safe.